Perhaps the single biggest mystery of SpaceX's Starship program is how exactly the company plans to refuel the largest spacecraft ever built after it reaches orbit. Recently, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk addressed employees inside the Star Factory, outlining the future of the Starship program with a focus on hardware advancements and full reusability. During the talk, he also revealed new details about orbital refueling and shared an impressive new render video showcasing the process. According to Musk, this is similar to aerial refueling for airplanes, but in this case, it's orbital refilling of rockets, which has never been done before. The video shows two starships autonomously docking belly to belly while orbiting a few hundred miles above Earth. This kind of maneuver is highly complex, but SpaceX can draw on its experience with Dragon capsule dockings at the International Space Station, which rely on similar laser navigation systems and mechanical docking mechanisms. In the render, four docking attachment points are visible. The two forward points handle alignment, while the two lower points located near the aft sections contain the fuel transfer lines. The setup uses a straightforward probe and drogue system, a well-proven design used in both spaceflight and aviation refueling. The propellants will transfer from one vehicle to the other by means of a pressure differential between the donor and recipient tanks, eliminating the need for complex pumping systems. And so what you, you, so you send a Starship to orbit with uh, this full of payload, and then you send a bunch of other Starships up, and you would refill the propellant on that Starship. And once the, the propellant tanks are mostly full, then you can depart for the Mars, for Mars or the Moon or, yeah. Elon also mentions that most of the mass would be oxygen, so it's almost 80% oxygen that gets transferred, a little over 20% fuel. Honestly, Musk's explanation in the presentation is somewhat oversimplified, particularly in its omission of an orbital fuel depot. Yet incorporating such a depot is crucial for future missions. The process of in-orbit refueling carries inherent risks, and the probability of failure increases with each additional transfer. Former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin highlighted this issue during a congressional hearing. He noted that even with an optimistic 98% success rate per refueling operation, which is extremely optimistic, a mission that needs 15 to 20 tanker launches sees the overall success rate drop fast. We're talking about a 67% to 74% probability. That's not ideal for crewed flights or billion-dollar payloads. A dedicated orbital depot completely changes that equation. Instead of sending tankers to dock directly with mission vehicles like landers, habitats, or interplanetary probes, you simply top off the depot. Then the mission vehicle comes up, docks once, receives all its fuel, and departs. It's safer, faster, and keeps your spacecraft in low Earth orbit for less time. That's important because LEO is cluttered and not where you want to linger with a sensitive payload. Tankers aren't designed to store cryogenic propellant long term. Their thermal systems are built for re-entry, not for orbit. A depot, on the other hand, doesn't need to re-enter the atmosphere, so you can optimize it with better insulation larger tanks and fewer complex components like header tanks or re-entry protection. Most importantly, the depot is not expendable. It remains in orbit, supports multiple missions, and improves the economics and reliability of spaceflight. It's essentially infrastructure in space. Once it exists, everything gets easier. SpaceX is aiming to conduct its first orbital propellant transfer demonstration as early as next year a major milestone in enabling long-duration space missions. However, this is a complex and unprecedented challenge. Cryogenic propellant transfer, the process of moving extremely cold fuels like liquid hydrogen or oxygen between spacecraft and microgravity, is notoriously difficult. Traditionally, such transfers have been envisioned as taking place at large orbital depots, acting as refueling stations for deep space missions. However, in the zero-gravity environment of space, controlling the behavior of cryogenic liquids becomes a major obstacle. Without gravity, it is hard to manage fluid movement, measure remaining fuel, and maintain tank pressure. These issues have long delayed the practical implementation of in-space refueling, despite its enormous potential to extend mission range and reduce launch mass. Fortunately, SpaceX is not starting from scratch. 
A 2006 study by seven Lockheed Martin engineers and a NASA researcher proposed a clever alternative to complex zero-gravity refueling using small amounts of acceleration to settle the propellant during transfer. But before we go any further, make sure to hit that subscribe button and help us reach 10,000 subscribers. All right, let's get back to it. This low-level thrust creates a pseudo-gravity environment that helps separate the liquid from the gas in a tank, simplifying fuel handling. This approach is based on a fundamental Newtonian principle. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest. In orbit, without gravity, propellant floats freely inside a tank. If a spacecraft applies continuous thrust, the propellant resists that motion and remains stationary until it impacts the back of the tank. By opening a valve opposite the thrust direction, the propellant can be made to flow out naturally, as if gravity were pulling it. In a refueling scenario, a tanker docks with the receiving spacecraft, connects its tanks, and then applies gentle thrust away from the receiver. The propellant in the tanker attempting to stay still, is effectively pushed into the receiver's tank. According to the 2006 paper, sustaining this kind of low acceleration does not require large amounts of fuel, only around 10 to 100 pounds of settling propellant per hour for a 100-ton spacecraft. This fuel could come from gases already vented during normal pressure regulation. Applied to SpaceX's Starship, this method could be remarkably efficient. With large enough plumbing between vehicles, transferring more than 1,000 tons of propellant could take just a few hours. The propellant tax incurred, meaning fuel spent on settling and losses, would be minimal, around 20 to 50 tons per refueling. Even in the most demanding case, transferring 1,600 tons, efficiencies should remain high. Fully refueling an orbital starship or deep with about 1,200 tons of usable propellant might require 8 to 14 tanker launches, but up to 80% or more of the transferred fuel could remain usable at the end of the process. One of the remaining technical hurdles is the development of robust autonomous fluid couplings that can reliably transfer cryogenic fluids in space. However, progress in this area would unlock profound benefits. In the long term, in-space refueling has the potential to revolutionize spaceflight. Spacecraft could launch with empty tanks and fuel up in orbit, eliminating the need for heavy insulation and structural reinforcements designed for launch loads. This would reduce mass, lower costs, and allow vehicles to carry larger payloads or reach more distant destinations. Ultimately, it could pave the way for a truly reusable and scalable space transportation system. The first major application of orbital propellant transfer will be to support NASA's return of humans to the moon. According to the mission plan, a Starship Human Landing System, HLS, will be launched into Earth orbit by a Starship launch vehicle. There, it will be refueled by multiple Starship tanker missions before making its way to a near-rectilinear halo orbit, NRHO, around the moon. Once in lunar orbit, the Starship HLS will rendezvous with NASA's Orion spacecraft, which will have been launched separately by the Space Launch System, SLS. Two astronauts will transfer from Orion to Starship HLS and descend to the lunar surface for a mission lasting approximately seven days. Of course, SpaceX's broader ambition goes far beyond the moon. Elon Musk has repeatedly emphasized that Starship is central to his vision of making humanity a multiplanetary species. As outlined during his presentation at the 67th International Astronautical Congress, IAC, this vision relies on a fully reusable launch architecture supported by in-orbit refueling. This would enable Starship to transport up to 100 metric tons of cargo or 100 passengers to Mars. Musk has continued to reaffirm this goal, emphasizing that a high launch cadence combined with orbital refueling is essential to making routine interplanetary travel and eventually Mars colonization a reality. However, much like orbital refueling, Musk's proposed mission architecture may prove overly optimistic. A recent 
study by researchers from the German Aerospace Center DLR, the University of Bremen, and the Technical University of Dresden evaluated the feasibility of SpaceX's plans, drawing on information from the company's website, conference presentations, and the Starship User Manual. A key focus was the spacecraft's dry mass, which refers to the weight without fuel or payload. While SpaceX targets a dry mass of around 100 tons, the researchers estimate it to be closer to 204 tons when factoring in the structure, thermal protection, life support systems, power systems, tanks, and engines. This increased mass significantly reduces the spacecraft's delta V or its ability to change velocity, which is essential for mission-critical maneuvers. For example, the ascent from the Martian surface to orbit alone requires about 4.8 kilometers per second of delta V and consumes roughly 72% of the total available. After accounting for other maneuvers, such as trans-Earth injection and Earth orbit capture, the remaining delta V falls well short of the roughly 3 kilometers per second required to return safely to Earth. Although SpaceX intends to refuel Starship on Mars using locally produced propellant, this may not fully offset the limitations posed by the current mass and fuel capacity. A successful round trip may require significant reductions in spacecraft mass, improvements in engine efficiency, or additional in-space refueling, possibly both in Earth and Mars orbit. There is yet another promising option to overcome the limitations of current spaceflight. Using more efficient engines powered by nuclear propulsion, scientists and engineers are actively exploring advanced concepts that could make future human space missions faster and more energy efficient. One such concept is the Centrifugal Nuclear Thermal Rocket, or CNTR, which was recently examined in a new research paper. As the name suggests, the CNTR uses a centrifuge to keep uranium fuel in a molten liquid state, while hydrogen gas is bubbled through it to produce thrust. This design offers a significant efficiency advantage over traditional nuclear thermal rockets, NTRS, which rely on solid uranium fuel. Conventional NTRs can achieve a specific impulse, a measure of how efficiently fuel is converted into thrust, of about 900 seconds. CNTRs, however, could potentially reach an impressive 1,500 seconds. According to the paper, the reactor spins to maintain a layer of liquid uranium along an inner hydrogen permeable surface. As hydrogen bubbles through this hot liquid layer, it heats up rapidly and exits through a nozzle to create thrust. However, while the concept is promising, it faces serious engineering challenges. For example, harmful byproducts like xenon and samarium must be continuously removed to maintain reactor efficiency and accurately modeling how the hydrogen interacts with the liquid fuel is extremely complex. One critical issue is ensuring that only hydrogen escapes the nozzle. If any uranium escapes, the reaction weakens and engine performance drops. Although CNTR concepts have been studied for years, they remain in the simulation phase and are likely still a long way from physical prototyping. Even so, nuclear propulsion is steadily advancing, and it is possible that by the time CNTRs are ready, nuclear-powered spacecraft may already be traversing the solar system. Starship's ultimate goal is to become the definitive vehicle for interplanetary travel. Whether it relies on orbital refueling or eventually incorporates nuclear propulsion, these are simply different paths to achieving that vision. At present, Starship is evolving at a breathtaking pace. It often feels like no two versions of the vehicle are ever exactly the same. Given this rapid development cycle, it is safe to say that the Starship of the future will look significantly different from the one we see today.